Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Shouts and Associates in our Get Far Cited in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR, or Federal Acquisition Regulations, is the rulebook that the federal government must follow when making purposes. Our webinar series pulls from contacting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We'll post all of the recordings on our website and YouTube channel, where we have over 400 government contracting webinars available for download. A special thanks to our webinar partner in this series, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We would also like to thank our friends at Open the FAR for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring this series or one part, please contact hello at jennifershouse.com. And now a little bit about us. We work with primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. And uh, we would also like to let you know about some ways to reach government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For pricing or to place an order, please email hello at jennifershouse.com. And as noted, we now have over 400 webinars in our archives. And as we continue to educate federal contractors, I would like to bring to your attention our webinar schedule for 2021. The full schedule and speakers are all confirmed. First up is a monthly series called the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. This is a live webinar series held each month. These will take place on the second Friday of each month in 2021 at 12 p.m. Eastern. We have assembled a group of four panelists who are subject matter experts on a specific federal contracting topic. The panelists will make a short presentation about the topics listed here on your screen and then take your live questions about that topic. So for example, January 8th, January will kick off uh, with our panelists covering CMMC on Friday, January 8th. Our panelists include attorneys, consultants, and other industry professionals. You can sign up on our website under the Q&A Cafe tab. Sponsorships are available. Please email hello at jennifershouse.com for immediate and pricing details. And in our second webinar series in 2021, we will be covering each part of the DFARS, or Defense Federal Acquisition Regulations. Similar to our current FAR series, this will be a weekly series dedicated to defense contracting, its rules, and regulations. This series is complimentary and will be held on Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. We'll run through the parts sequentially, which means that we will start the year with, part, with DFARS Part 201 and finish with Part 252 at the end of the year. You can sign up on our website under the DFAR tab. And again, sponsorships are available. Please email hello at jennifershouse.com for immediate kit and pricing details. And now we would like to uh, learn a bit more about today's speakers, Michelle Coleman and Sky Matizan. Uh, you can find their contact information here. And today we are covering FAR Part 52 with Sky and Michelle. The floor is now yours. Thank you. Um, and we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, my name is Michelle Coleman. I'm a government contracts attorney with uh, Colin Mooring. I've been in government contracts for over 10 years, and I started my career as a subcontracts administrator um, for government contractor. And my legal career, I started working at the Air Force as a litigator, where I litigated protesting claims. Um, and with my colleague, Sky Matheson, he'll introduce himself here shortly. Um, and over the, the past several years, I've been representing contractors like many of you um, in claims and disputes uh, with the government, drafting REAs, dealing with time and sub disputes, and, uh, and other areas as well. So we're very pleased to speak with you about FAR Part 52, and I'll turn it over to Sky so he can introduce himself. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, this is Sky Matheson, um, and as Michelle said, uh, we have a similar career track. Um, you know, we both worked at the Air Force uh, litigating contract disputes, bid protests, um, and after that, I came to Kroll & Mooring, been there for about six years, um, and as, in that capacity, we do cost litigation, cost counseling, and any type of dispute that arises during performance um, is primarily our focus, um, so any types of changes, delays, anything where you're performing and the government is impacting you, we're going to get into these down in a bit. Um, but we help with both the counseling side to avoid disputes and then also litigating if we need to. Back to you, Michelle. Thank you, Sky. And we're here to talk about FAR Part 52, the solicitations, provisions, and contract clauses. Um, so if you could please uh, go to the next slide. As you can see from our agenda, we have a lot of topics to cover in this hour. Um, and many of these topics could be covered in an hour presentation on their own. Um, so you're probably not going to walk away being an expert on every single clause um, in FAR Part 52, 
but you certainly will walk away just knowing and being aware that these claws exist, which truly is half the battle. Um, and so as you may know, um, there are a ton of FAR 52 clauses. We've lumped them into these topic areas. You're not going to find those particular topic areas um, in the FAR, um, but that's kind of how we grouped those clauses together. We're not going to cover everything. In fact, we're really going to focus on the contract clauses um, portion of FAR Part 52 versus the solicitation clauses because we think that would add a little bit more value to you. Um, and just for your reference, there's a link to FAR Part, um, FAR part 52 on slide six. Um, which you're you know, welcome to use, of course, during this presentation or otherwise. So we can go to the next slide, please, where we'll talk about you know, what is FAR Part 52. So FAR Part 52, it's an instruction manual for contracting officers, but also for you know, contractors to understand um, which clauses may be in their contracts um, and, ha and, and includes the language for those contracts. So FAR Part 52, it prescribes procedures for contracting officers for incorporating, identifying, and modifying provisions and clauses in both solicitations and contracts and for using alter alternates, um, but then also describes the derivation of those FAR provisions and clauses. Um, so as you can see in that little um, picture there on the slide, the subpart is arranged by subject matter, um, but not in this kind of sense of where you saw with our agenda where we have the different topics but in the sense of the way in which you read that FAR Part, um, FAR part 52 clause. So the clauses start with FAR 52.2 um, and then the next numbers correspond with the FAR subject part. So um, for, the, the, um, for the picture that we have on the slide, um, the changes fixed price clause FAR Part 52.2.43 is that um, subject matter. Um, and then dot one as that part or subpart. Next slide, please. FAR Part 52.3 um, is where you could find, where you may find the FAR matrix. So the matrix is used to determine which clauses are required, uh, when, um, and then which clauses are required when applicable, and then optional clauses for a particular contract type. So this is a helpful sort of matrix to be aware of. Um, as you're trying to understand, you know, why a particular clause might be in your contract or what particular clause might be in your contract if you're looking um, at the early stages of a solicitation. Uh, going into the next slide, please. So um, before we sort of delve into these specific clauses, we thought it would be helpful to go over some very general information about FAR Part 52. So the clauses in FAR Part 52 are, uh, and like we said, we're going to go over the contract clauses. These are clauses that are going to govern the terms and conditions of your contract. So um, we would be remiss if we didn't say um, when you have a government contract to make sure that you're reading your contract and understanding which FAR clauses that are going to be um, into, in your contract and particularly the ones that you need to flow, flow down to subcontractors as well. Um, the contracting, contracting officers can modify FAR clauses, um, but only if the FAR actually authorizes them to do so. So you might see some clauses that have fill in the blank um, or have alternative language that the contracting officer can use. Um, also, there are agency specific clauses, and I see there's going to be a series on the DFAR, the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement. Um, for example, is one of those agency-specific type of um, clauses that you might find, but also other agencies like the Air Force, for example, has the AFARS, which is another FAR supplement. So you'll see clauses in your contract um, that relate to agency-specific or Air Force-specific or, you know, Navy-specific clauses. Um, and then also sometimes you'll find these special contract clauses, which is generally found in, in the H clause section of your contract, um, where the agency in that particular buying um, activity might have specific clauses that relate to a particular type of contract. Uh, you'll find these FAR Part 52 clauses in Section I, generally, um, the contract clauses section. And again, for tailored or full text or special clauses, you'll find in Section H. Um, but I, I can't reiterate again just how important it is to review these clauses um, to make sure that you understand the ones that are going to be applicable, that you're abiding by them, that you're flowing them down to um, subcontractors as necessary. Next slide, please. So this is the roadmap. So again, we have a lot to cover. Um, we're going to start with the remedy granting clauses. And these are the clauses that give a contractor a remedy. Um, and, and we're just going to go over just the common remedy granting clauses in this particular um, presentation today. Uh, but this is, this is where contractors are generally going to be allowed to have an equitable adjustment or request an equitable adjustment for particular actions that happen under the contract. 
Um, and then once we kind of move from the remedy granting clauses, we'll, we'll address these other um, topic areas as they come. Next slide, please. All right, so changes um, is the first you know, common remedy granting clause that we have up. I, I often say that you, it's hard to find a government contract where there isn't going to be a, at least one change uh, at any given, given time. So it's really under, important to understand you know, what these changes clauses are so the, the changes clauses govern um, what types of changes a contracting officer can make to your contract. There are different clauses, as you can see, um, based on the different contract types. Um, but generally, um, the clauses list like the permissible changes, and those are generally related to changes to drawings, designs or specifications, method of shipment or packing, uh, place of delivery, description of services performed, or time of performance. Uh, and changes under these clauses are generally a, made by written order or modification by the contracting officer. So those are considered direct or express changes. However, sometimes the contracting officer may make changes to the contract without issuing an order or a modification. And these are changes that are typically due to some contracting officer action or inaction that has changed the contract. And those are considered constructive changes. Uh, and they're also compensable under this clause. So these clauses allow the government to make changes to the contract and they're able to do it without breaching the contract. So therefore, when the contracting officer is acting within the bounds of um, the clauses that you see here, the contracting officer isn't breaching the contract. Um, important things to know about the, the changes clause is that for changes, whether you know, direct or constructive, you, you have to, under the clause, notify the contracting officer within 30 days um, or in any time that's prescribed in a particular clause um, or your contract that there has been a change. And the remedy for a change under these clauses is generally um, an equitable adjustment, which is the cost of the change plus a reasonable profit. So if FAR 52, 243-6, um, um, which is middle, middle way down um, the list of the FAR clauses is in your contract, that's the change order accounting clause. Um, it's really important that you take note of that and ensure that you're separately tracking any costs that you may have um, related to a change um, if that clause is in your contract. However, um, if that clause isn't in your contract, we'd still recommend separately tracking costs for changes if possible, um, just because it's really important to be able to demonstrate the, the cost impact and it's much easier to do so if you're able to separately track the cost of, of the change in some record. Um, or some ledger that would be able to, that would be easy to provide to the government. Um, the last uh, FAR clause that we have listed here, FAR 52.212-4C, is the commercial items um, FAR changes clause. And the important thing to note for that uh, clause is that commercial item changes must be bilateral. Next slide, please. So this, um, this slide is going to talk about, we're going to talk about delays and stop work orders, um, suspension of work orders. We'll start with suspension of work. This is generally for a fixed price construction contract. And under this clause, the CO may suspend, delay, or interrupt any part of the work. And if the government's suspension is for an unreasonable period of time due to contracting officer action or inaction, then uh, the contractor is entitled to an adjustment um, to increase the cost of performance, um, but there is no profit that's allowed on, on the uh, suspension of work clause. But it's important to note that, you know, to the extent that you're experiencing a suspension of work um, issue, that you assert recovery within 20 days of the CEO, the contracting officer or CEO's failure to act or enact. Um, and it's also important to note that if there's some sort of recovery, and I, this really goes generally, but the, the clause specifically says if there's some sort of recovery that you can seek under another clause, um, that recovery under this clause is not going to be permissible. So the next um, order that we'll talk about is stop work orders. Um, stop work orders can be issued by the government uh, within for 90 days or more by agreement. Um, after the period ends, the government must either resume work or terminate the contract. The remedy under a stop work order for a contractor that's experiencing, you know, cost or schedule impact is an equitable adjustment plus profit um, or an extension of the delivery schedule um, or both to the extent that, you know, the contract is impacted both ways. Contractors must assert their entitlement to an adjustment within 30 days after the end of that stop work or suspension of work period or excuse me, stop work period. 
for both stop work, suspension of work, and even the government delay of work um, clause that I'll talk about here in just a minute, I just want to um, take a minute to note that, you know, like the changes clause where you can make a constructive change argument, you could similarly um, make a suspension of work or stop work change uh, constructive argument. Um, even if the government hasn't issued some for formal letter or order stopping work or suspending work um, or delaying work. So FAR 52-242-17, the government delay of work states that the CO action or inaction that affects performance and causes cost or schedule impacts are recoverable. Um, again, there's, there's these notification requirements and a lot of these remedy granting clauses and for the government delay of work, it's a 20 day uh, notification requirement after you know, 20 days after that government delay. And so the, the final um, delay that I'll talk about on this slide um, is the excusable delay provision. Um, there's an excusable delay provision for multiple different types of contracts. Um, but the key thing to note, and you may have heard a lot about excusable delays, particularly given the, the global pandemic that we're, we're all sort of living and working through. Um, but excusable delay is defensive only, meaning a contractor isn't able to recover costs um, for the excusable delay, under the excusable delay provision. Um, and a contractor can seek um, an extension or um, in some cases, the contractor is using that excusable delay as an excuse for um, reasons for the delay to prevent a termination for default. Um, the delay, excusable delay clause generally enumerates, some of them enumerate the types of, um, the types of acts that would allow for an excusable delay. And some examples of that are acts of God, strikes, um, pandemics, for example. Um, but the important thing to remember, remember about excusable delay is that it has to be more than just present. Um, there has to be a cause, um, the, the excusable delay has to actually be causing the contractor some delay. Um, and the contractor needs to be able to prove that and demonstrate that there are concurrent delays that it's um, responsible for as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sky. Great, thank you, Michelle. So now we're on the differing site condition clauses. So next slide. And so for the differing site conditions, um, this is primarily thought of as construction related. Um, construction contractors encounter differing site conditions all the time. It is just part of life on a construction contract, but it also applies and could apply in many other types of contracts, service contracts, um, anything for repair or maintenance. Essentially, the different site condition clause is different than what Michelle was just talking about with both changes and delays. Changes and delays are something that's happening during performance. The government directs something new or the government constructively is changing the, the manner or method of performance or they're slowing you down either because they're taking express action to stop work or they're just impacting you and delaying you. This is something different. This is a situation where you got the RFP, you bid the contract, um, the government hasn't actually done anything, but in the course of your performance, um, it's a lot harder, it's a lot more cost uh, intensive, and it's different than what you expected in some way. And if it fits in either of these two boxes of which way it could be, then this is a different way to claim it. It has nothing to do with the government is doing nothing to do with what the CO is doing or directing you on the contract. Just simply, I'm encountering things that are different than how I expected them to be. So the two types of different site conditions, uh, the first one is the most common, um, and it's essentially the, the contract-based, the solicitation-based one, which is that um, what you actually encounter as a contractor differs from what um, you expected at the time of bidding. So it's different than what the RFP and the contract led you to believe was going to be there. So key to this is the, the RFP and the, and the contract actually need to have some representations of something. Um, if there's just silence and you just made assumptions, um, that's not gonna qualify. But this comes into play all the time when the RFP signals things that you're gonna find. And it could apply to numerous types of contractors. Think of any kind of construction contractor. Um, government says to build a building. Uh, when you start digging out the foundation, the soil level is gonna be mostly you know, loose soil, no rock, something like that. You encounter rocks, now you have a different site condition. The RFP told you what to believe, um, you relied on that when you bid, and then you encounter something different. Like I said, it can also apply to non-construction entities. Let's say you have a maintenance contract where you're cleaning cars or cleaning airplanes as they come in, and the contract represents that you're gonna need, you know, we're gonna give you airplanes in this type of condition, and so you bid up your price for how many people you need and what supplies you need to clean based on that understanding of what you think the contract um, is telling you, 
and then when the con when the cars or the airplanes or whatever it is come into your uh, facility to actually perform your maintenance, it's entirely different and worse, and it requires a lot more time. That could be a different site condition. Um, the second type of different site condition is where what you encounter differs from the ordinary industry expectations. This is a lot harder to prove, and it's essentially a situation where nobody could have expected this to be like this. So, for example, if you have a contract to perform, you know, some work in Hawaii and it starts to the soil is frozen because of, a, you know, abnormal once a millennia winter. Um, nobody would have expected to have equipment to prepare for frozen soil. So that would be a type two different site condition. Key things to remember is if you encounter one or you think you encounter one, the requirement is that you notify the contracting officer promptly. So not just anyone in the government, notify the contracting officer, at least CC them. Um, don't disturb the site. Don't could just dig up the stuff and proceed because then when the CO gets there, they say, well, I can't assess whether it is or it isn't. So don't disrupt what you see there. Um, another important thing is that um, for commercial item contracts, this clause is typically not in the commercial item contract, but you still have the general right if you can prove the same types of, of um, you know, what the RFP led you to believe and how you relied on that. Um, you can get it under a common law misrepresentation theory. It doesn't require anyone to have done anything bad, just that the government um, led you to believe certain things and you relied on them. A key point to underlie all of this is that ultimately you're going to have to prove to the government or at least, you know, have some sort of way to prove that how you bid was in reliance on what your expectation was. So if you have no paper trail and no evidence of how you bid the document up, and no internal documentation of what your expectations were, it gets a lot harder to say you assumed something because it's not necessarily going to tie out as cleanly. So just to be aware, keep good records of how you're making your bid uh, price assumptions can usually help. Um, and so next slide, we can go on to the last type of remedy granting clause, government property. So this is one for government furnished equipment, government furnished property, property that the contract has the government basically paying you to acquire. Uh, during the performance. So this is, you know, you're using it, but it's the government's property. Makes sense. That's the name of the title. Um, key things to remember here on government furnished property is um, there's reciprocal requirements. So the contractor has certain obligations under these clauses, or especially under the, the main one, 52245-1. The contractor is going to have obligations, right? You, it's going to specify the way that you handle the government property, that you safeguard the government property, the way you have to keep track of to account for the government property, right? If you leave the shed unlocked and it gets stolen, um, there's going to be a risk of loss that's probably going to be falling on you. Um, so it sets out requirements for the contractor. It also sets out requirements for the government. Um, for example, the government has an obligation to timely deliver the government furnished property. So if they say, you know, in order to perform your contract, we're going to give you this, this, and this, you have a right to rely that you're going to get that and you're going to get it in a timely fashion. You also have the right to rely that what the government gives you is going to be suitable for the purpose of performing the contract. So if the government says, you know, please deliver us some cars or Humvees and don't worry about the, we're going to save some money, we're going to supply you with the tires and they give you go-kart tires, they've given you tires, but that's not suitable for the purpose. And so there's going to be a remedy. Again, these are the remedy granting clauses. There's going to be a remedy that you're entitled to some, you know, the cost that you have to incur in order to go and perform the work. So maybe go out and buy new tires or make new tires. Um, or because the government is delayed, you have to adjust your way of, you know, designing the contract. Any of the costs that you can prove that you incurred um, because of the government's GFP errors or, or delays or whatever, um, those are going to be costs that you get. Next slide. All right. Michelle, I'll take it back <laughs> over to you because termination is next. Thank you, Sky. So this is just a roadmap. Now we're moving from the remedy granting clauses and we'll talk about termination, business ethics and compliance, cost or pricing, invoicing and payments, ordering clauses and labor and employment next. And then we'll move on to the next um, segment. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so termination, um, not a remedy granting clause, um, at least not for contractors. Um, under the termination provisions and, and, and clauses in the FAR, you know, the government has the right to terminate for convenience or for default. Um, so for terminations for convenience, um, this is a broad right and remedy that the government has. Um, and the government is able to terminate a contractor without cause, meaning there doesn't have to be a particular reason under the contract that the government's decided to terminate. Um, the, com the government just has that right to terminate 
um, the contract for its convenience and at its convenience. Uh, and the government can do that either in part, in whole or in part. So that can, the government can decide that we need to terminate this entire contract or we need to uh, terminate a particular claim or type of work with um, work scope within the contract. Um, for terminations for convenience, the contractor, and this goes for really any termination, both terminations, but it's really important that the contractor immediately stop um, the work that's being terminated, notify um, any subcontractors or vendors or lower tier subcontractors uh, that work has been terminated for convenience and provide um, guidance to your subcontractors and vendors based on the guidance provided to the government and also the guidance provided in the clauses um, of what that subcontractor needs to be doing next. Um, it's important for contractors to mitigate any potential costs that they may have as they're, um, you know, working through the termination, uh, but then also settling any liabilities in connection with the termination. So if you're, you know, ordering supplies for a particular um, that, that might be used for, for whatever you might be building for the government, for example, um, you'll want to make sure that you're, you know, you're you're ending those um, supply orders or canceling those supply orders. You want to make sure um, that you're, you know, notifying your, your workers that, you know, work's been terminated and, and, and try and mitigate those um, labor costs to the extent that you can. Um, just important to settle, make sure you're settling those liabilities with a termination. Um, for terminations for convenience, um, contractors can recover termination costs. And so it's important, um, especially for you to understand, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the commercial item clause, but um, for terminations, non-commercial terminations for convenience, contractors have one year to submit a termination settlement proposal from um, the day of termination. And, um, you know, your termination settlement costs are going to be guided by, the, you know, what, what is allowable under the FAR, the Federal Acquisition, Re Acquisition Regulation, um, in particular the cost principles, looking at those and using those for guidance, but then also FAR Part 49. Um, but for commercial items contracts, um, termination for conveniences are a little are a little different. Um, there's a two-pronged um, method for recovery. Uh, termination, uh, commercial items termination for convenience is FAR 52.212-4L, and it says that contractors can recover a percentage of the contract price reflecting the percentage of work performed plus reasonable charges. That recovery is a little different because you're literally looking at, you know, how much of a, how much have I performed for a particular on this particular contract, um, and then and, you know multiplying that out for the cost that that you would be entitled to for the work, um, and then getting those reasonable charges as well. And there's also no one-year requirement to submit your termination settlement proposal under a commercial items contract like there is on um, the FAR Part 49 termination for convenience. However, we would say and advise that, you know, it makes sense for contractors to submit their termination settle proposals as soon as possible, um, just to ensure, you know, that you're getting it and you're getting your proposal in front of that contracting officer who terminated and understands, you know, the contract and in the event that there may be a change um, later on down the road. And it's just always better when you can seek recovery quickly. Uh, conversely, termination for default, you know, things that contract, something, uh, the term, the term that contractors don't want to hear. Um, contractors similarly have to, you know, stop all terminated work um, and notify, you know, your subcontractors and settle liabilities related to that termination. Um, but terminations for default are, are much more drastic um, and have uh, different consequences. Um, we have a note here about the show cause and cure notices. Uh, the government may be required to issue cure notice or may issue a show cause notice. Um, these are notices that you'll definitely want to respond to. Um, these notices are asking you to either cure um, the, 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 what's causing you to default um, or show cause why the government should not terminate you for default. And it's important um, that you're you know, documenting why as a contractor, you think that you should not be terminated, um, and and putting that on record for the government, so that that has so the government has that information before them and has to make that decision, um, and review use that information when it's making that decision of whether or not to terminate for default. Um, so it's really important to respond to those um, those clauses um, when they're submitted and and, and particularly when they're required. Um, also, the consequences of termination default, as I mentioned, it's a drastic sanction to the government, but it's also drastic for contractors in the sense that, you know, 
the contractor might be entitled or might be required to provide liquidated damages to the government uh, for a ter being terminated for default. The government isn't going to be required to pay for unaccepted work. So if you have a contract where you're delivering simulators and you were required to deliver 10 simulators under the contract and you only had one simulator, um, you know, that was actually accepted, um, you know, one that was re rejected and then other, you know, a few others that were on the way for any of that work that was not accepted, the government isn't going to be required to pay. Uh, also, if you, you're receiving progress or partial payments or advanced payments, the government may not be required to make those payments as well. And in addition to not getting paid for some of the work that you may have already performed uh, under the contract, the government can assess what is called excess re-procurement costs. So the government really needs whatever item or service that you're providing to the government, um, and they can no longer get it from you because you've been terminated for default. Um, or the contractor because they've been terminated for default, the government may look to another contractor to perform, you know, that item or provide that item or perform that service uh, and may, um, under the regulation, turn to the contractor to pay for those, um, the cost of that new contractor, the difference. So um, it's really, you know, really, really important. I think we've talked a little bit about, you know, notices, providing notices of delays and changes and, and things of that sort, but also just keeping documentation. So it's really important um, that contractors are, are documenting uh, performance um, so that they're able to kind of stave off any, any um, potential terminations for default. Um, and then also reputational damage because contractors um, and a lot of requests for proposals, um, RFPs or solicitations, the government's now asking all the asking contractors to say or identify when they've been terminated for default or terminated for convenience. Um, and so that's something that's going into decision making um, for contracting officers when they're awarding new contracts. Um, so there could be some damage there. And also, I just want to point out too that the government um, can um, and often does post notices on. Um, uh, notices online about terminations as well. So there's just some reputational damage that's important for contractors to be aware of. Next slide. Please, thank you. Um, business ethics and compliance, turning from something a little less somber um, than terminations for default. Um, contractors are, and there are a lot of compliance requirements um, under the FAR, and we're not gonna talk about all of them today. We're really gonna focus on these um, two particular um, FAR clauses. Um, but for Contractor Code of Business Ethics and Conduct, we thought it was really important for contractors to understand um, when this clause is um, applied and, and what it means for contractors. So um, for that first FAR clause, um, 52203-13, that clause needs to be incor is incorporated in contracts at $6 million or more um, or perform and performances over 120 days. So, and then it also is slowed down and required in certain subcontracts and it requires uh, contractors to have and establish um, a business ethics awareness and compliance program because there's a mandatory disclosure requirement, which means contractors are required to disclose in writing to the agency's Office of Inspector General if it has credible evidence you know, that there's a principal employee agent or subcontractor who's violated the law in some way, particularly is it really to fraud, conflict, conflict of interest, bribery, or gratuity violations. Um, or if a contractor, subcontractor, employee, or agent, or principal has violated the Civil False Claims Act um, as it relates to any award, performance, or close out. So it's really important to establish that business ethics and awareness and compliance program to ensure that you can identify these instances um, and, and that you're properly notifying the OIG um, for that agency if there is a violation. In addition to that, we've got the display of hotline posters um, for our 52203-14. Um, you know, that's required for contractors to display if, if their contract exceeds a certain value and the agency has a poster, um, these fraud hotline posters uh, in public places where their employees can see. And it's also um, maybe required to be slowed down to subcontracts as well. Next slide, please. All right, thanks, Michelle. Taking over for cost and pricing here. So this is, again, this is one that we could do in a two-day course. So we'll try and cover the, the high-level points in three minutes, um, but certainly uh, please reach out if you have any additional comments or questions on any of these. 
Um, three major topics. We have a lot of clauses there. Many of the clauses relate to defective pricing, uh, which is under a statute that used to be called TINA. Um, there's allowable cost and payment, which is about um, how you bill and what costs you can bill for, be reimbursed under cost type contracts or flexibly priced contracts. Um, there's also just a, another concept of cost and pricing, uh, which is FAR Part 31. Uh, there's been a presentation already on FAR Part 31, but it's important how it relates to these things because some of those costs are subject to an allowable cost and payment, for example, what you can bill for, both on your direct costs and then also a reimbursement on direct costs, but then also on your indirect rates and when you get the indirect rate proposals and get trued up. And so that's that final clause there, the 52-243-4 with the indirect rates. Um, three major topics of cost or pricing, right? So, I mean, cost or pricing topics um, can come up both pre-award, before the contract is issued, so how the government structures the solicitation, um, what dollars they say are going to be awarded, um, what type of contract they're anticipating. These are the things that can affect, um, you know, what the obligations are to disclose certain information, uh, whether your contract is going to be covered by CAS, which we have there in the middle, 52-230-1 um, through 7, but the cost accounting standards. Um, so again, there's a lot of different areas that are in play. And then during, you know, post-award, as you bill, as you invoice the government, uh, what costs are you allowed to do? What costs are you not allowed to do? Um, and then all the way through, as I said, the allowable cost of payment clause, if it's a flexibly priced contract, through the indirect rates. And you, as you reconcile and true those up, maybe several years after performance. So those are the big buckets of cost or pricing. It's a massive topic, um, probably easiest to split into three categories. Um, going from the most applicable to most contractors in most situations to the least applicable. Um, so FAR Part 31 is the most applicable, and then we'll cover defective uh, TINA um, and whether or not there's an obligation to disclose certified cost or pricing data. And then lastly, we'll cover CAS. So FAR Part 31, there's already been a presentation if you watch the FAR Part 31. If not, go back on um, the Jennifer's website and, and watch FAR Part 31. But essentially, if you have a flexibly priced contract um, you know, T&M contract, the material of T&M is going to be subject to FAR Part 31. If you have a flexibly priced cost type contract, that's going to be FAR Part 31. Um, even if you don't, right, let's say you have an, a firm fixed price lump sum contract, it's not going to be subject to FAR Part 31 until you hit some sort of an event where cost analysis is required. The government wants you to make a big proposal for a big new modification. You had a contract to build three airplane hangars and now they want um, a fifth one, which is going to be completely different, you start submitting costs. And again, there's just certain things that the government can start looking at FAR Part 31 rules. Same with an REA. Michelle and I talked about the different remedy granting clauses. There's changes, there's delays, differing sites. So you submit a request for equitable adjustment. You say you're entitled to some cost. Um, the government's able to go through those and parse out um, on FAR Part 31 rules what they think are allowable costs, what they think are unallowable. Same with um, terminations that Michelle just covered. So if you submit your termination, again, firm fixed price contract, it wasn't subject to FAR Part 31 cost rules as you went through performance, but if the government terminates you for convenience and you're entitled to submit a termination cost settlement proposal within a year, that's going to be subject to FAR Part 31. So just be aware that FAR Part 31 applies um, to many types of contracts from the outset and many, many types of contracts, even if they're firm fixed price, um, for some reason or another that we just covered. Um, FAR Part 31 has a whole slew of what direct costs are, what indirect costs are, what costs are allowable, allocable, reasonable, specific areas for FAR Part 31, cost disallowances, and then specific rules on, um, you know, basically just how, how you account and charge for, for certain situations. Um, there's some general rules and some catch-alls and some very specific rules. So FAR Part 31, most applicable, but it's all spelled out, pretty easy to follow. Um, if you follow FAR Part 31, the, the, the regulations. The next area of slightly less applicable is uh, the TINA, or Certified Cost or Pricing Requirement. So this is a pre-award requirement, and the government gets a post-award remedy. So the pre-award requirement is if your contract is subject to the requirement to submit Certified Cost or Pricing data, or subject to the statutory TINA requirement, formerly known as TINA, then you have an obligation to submit stuff. You have to submit all facts, which is um, you know, defined at FAR Part 2.101, there's been a presentation on that as well, but certified cost or pricing data is a defined term. All facts as of the date of price agreement that reasonable, prudent buyers and sellers would um, consider to affect cost negotiations, price negotiations significantly. So 
if your contract is subject to it, you have an obligation to disclose. Key question for contractors is, well, when does it apply? Even if you see these clauses in your contract, that doesn't mean it, they apply. And the, by these contract clauses, I mean, if you look at the second bullet down, 52, 215-10 through 13, 20 through 21, even if you see those clauses, they don't necessarily apply. The certified cost pricing data requirements apply if your contract is over 2 million, and by contract, I should define it clear, your contract, subcontract, prime contract modification, or subcontract modification. And those are the four clauses there, 10 through 13. If any of those events are A, over $2 million, which is the current TINA threshold, and they're not subject to one of the exemptions, and the exemptions are spelled out in the FAR, in FAR Part 15.4, but those exemptions, the primary ones are, if you have a commercial item, contract, subcontract, modification, then that's going to be exempt because it's commercial item. It's exempt from TINA requirements, cost disclosure requirements. And that makes sense. The whole point of TINA is to let the government have equal footing for complex areas that there isn't really a commercial market for it. If you go to, you know, government soliciting for boxes of cereal and you propose Rice Krispies, the government has a way to figure out what that costs because they could go down to the local grocery store or there's just similar priced items that they could compare it to or they have three different companies all bidding the same types of things, they can figure out which one's the cheapest, they can figure out how cost competition works. So commercial items remove the requirement that the government gets all of your facts, all of your internal cost data. Um, but if instead you're building the first of its kind rocket ship to go to Mars, and you say that the price, that your bidding price, you're the only one bidding, and the bid price is gonna be a billion, the government doesn't know if that's fair and reasonable, or if that's high, if that's low, they have no idea, they have nothing to compare it to. So commercial items is an exemption, TINA doesn't apply. Another exemption is adequate price competition. There's slightly different rules for civilian agencies versus defense agencies, but essentially if there's, as an easy rule, if there's two or more bidders that are competing, then it's gonna be subject at the contract or subcontract award level. It's gonna be subject to adequate price competition. So if two people, two contractors are bidding, there's no need to disclose all of your secret sauce, your internal certified cost of pricing data, because the government can compare between the two bidders and find whichever one they think is, you know, the best value or lowest. Um, and if they want the solution of the higher price, then they can pick that. Uh, but they can, they know what they're getting because they have things to compare it to from a price standpoint. So slightly different rules for defense and civilian, but that's always a key that if there's two or more, you're 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 generally going to be good. Um, so that's adequate price competition. If either of those exemptions apply or two other exemptions, there's a utility or the government has waived the requirement then TINA is going to apply and you're going to have the obligation to submit everything. It's a disclosure statute. You don't need to use it. You don't need to, what you disclose to the government doesn't need to be then what you bid. You don't need to bid in strict compliance with what you disclose. It's purely disclosure statute. So the government knows what you're relying on. Material cost data is X and you show them the breakdown of everything and you can still set the price higher. You can have profit with whatever you want to. Uh, the government can negotiate you, but at least they're on the same level footing. That's TINA. Um, kind of medium on our Goldilocks here of um, what what applies more often. Um, if you have a, if the government alleges that you failed to disclose all facts and they think that they're injured by that, then those clauses kick in, 52, 215 10 through 13. Those are the government's post award remedy, is they allege defective pricing, the government files a claim against you, and they ask for the money back. Um, and if you're in that situation, definitely reach out to lawyers. Um, the last situation is CAS, that's the middle bullet, 52, 230. Dash two is the is the most common of those. Again, just like Tina, even if you see it in your contract, it doesn't necessarily mean your contract's CAS covered. CAS and whether you're covered by it is defined at FAR 48 CFR 9903.201-1B. Uh, and it spells out basically that, um, you know, again, lots of things are not subject to CAS, even if this is in there. One important just high level thing to remember is CAS applies to contracts and subcontracts. It doesn't apply to contractors. So a contractor doesn't walk around and say, I'm cast covered contractor. Specific contracts are gonna be cast covered or not. Open question about whether task orders themselves or, or the original IDIQ in that situation would be um, cast covered. Um, but again, generally consider that task orders are gonna be cast covered as well. Uh, open question though. So what is not cast, what's exempt from cast? Um, a lot of the same things that are exempt from TINA. So if you have a commercial item, if you have firm fixed price contract that's um, without any requirement to submit certified cost or pricing data um, based on adequate price competition, if you um, are under the TINA threshold, under 2 million, or 
and here's a new require a new exemption. If your contract is less than 7.5 million and you're not currently performing any other $7.5 million cash covered contract, then you're going to be exempt as well. Um, so it, it's the least applicable to contractors, especially small contractors. If it applies, it's extremely complex and onerous. Um, and so certainly by the time that it does apply, and it will apply at the time of award, either it will or it won't. It won't apply mid-contract performance. If it does, certainly um, you'd be in a position that you'd want to be having an accounting department um, and, and legal oversight of, of making sure you're CAS compliant because the government can bring CAS non-compliance lawsuits against the contractors. Next slide. So cost of pricing is all the things pre-award and post-award that goes into what costs are allowable, how the parties deal with disclosure requirements, whether contracts are subject to CAS, um, and, and if they are, what kind of compliance you need to do. This is similar to cost of pricing, but this is just basically the during performance, how does the contractor get paid? Um, that is usually the only benefit of the bargain that the contractor gets, right? You get payment. You agree to do a bunch of stuff and comply with a bunch of things, in exchange for payment. So these are the clauses, generally, the basket of clauses that deal with payment. Um, some of them will depend on the contract type. All of them will depend on the contract type. So if you have a firm fixed price lump sum contract, that's different than fixed price contracts that have some flexibility to them, whether those are fixed price incentive or fixed price equitable, uh, you know, just different, different types of um, adjustability within there. T&M contracts, time and materials, you know, I'm performing labor rates, but then I also going to be getting ODC costs that pass on to the government. So there's lots of different types of contracts, cost type contracts. Um, how you bill the government is going to depend on that. Um, and it's really going to depend on how the CLINs are specified. So look to section B of your contract and your CLINs are going to specify what you're required to do in exchange for what. So it's going to specify whether the CLIN is IDIQ or firm fixed price or cost type. It's going to specify what you're supposed to do. Um, and if you do it, you can bill for it. It's going to specify whether it's some sort of a lump sum. It's going to specify whether or not these are just estimates and you bill for the actual quantities you deliver, whether those quantities are hours that you work or services that you provide or number of units that you deliver. Um, there's different ways that contracts can get structured. Um, going down the list, progress payments and advance payments. Um, this, these sets of clauses include lots of ways the government can finance, right? So even if you have a firm fixed price contract, that's paid, there's a couple ways to pay firm fixed price contracts, either lump sum by month or lump sum by milestone, right? So once you complete one building, I pay you this amount or one floor of a building. Uh, those are milestones or, you know, this monthly, you agree that you're going to bill one twelfth of the contract pro rata every month for 12 months. Um, if you don't want to do that, then you can also just have the end amount, you know, so at the end of the two years of performance, I will deliver something and I'm entitled to X big dollar amount. Um, but during those two years, the government can finance me with progress payments. The government will typically ask in that situation for what your costs you're incurring, and then they'll pay some percentage of that, usually 85%. Um, that really rounds out invoicing and payments. There's a lot more there, but just be aware that there's multiple sections. Next slide. Okay, ordering clauses. Um, key things here is for indefinite delivery types of contracts, which are IDIQ, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity and then also requirements contracts. Um, their government is going to have a contract at the outset that guarantees very little, and then they're gonna place orders for the specific work through orders. Those could be task orders for services or delivery orders for supplies. Um, the clauses are gonna specify a lot of things. Key things to remember of what they're gonna specify is that the task orders they issue are always subject to the terms of the contract. The IDIQ is the contract. The requirements contract is the contract. The orders are just orders issued against those. However, in certain circumstances, the orders can also be contracts. Um, Supreme Court has held that all GSA task orders are contracts. Um, any contract that the government, or any task order that the government places, just basically ordering off a of menu of IDIQ terms, um, they can unilaterally order that. And that's probably going to be less of a contract. Um, but if the government asks for something new, like a new scope of work or new rates or new things that weren't contemplated by the IDIQ, they're certainly allowed to ask for it. The parties bilaterally agree on it and bilaterally execute in order. That's going to be more akin to a contract. So just be aware that there's, um, even though you're executing a contract, it's still going to say that the task orders that you're executing are going to be subject to the terms and from an order of precedence. If there's anything in the overarching contract that conflicts, then the overarching contract is going to control. Um, last thing to keep in mind is that consideration has to be there. So an IDIQ might guarantee very little. It might say, 
we have the right to order something down the road. We're not ordering anything now, but you're guaranteed some minimum quantity or some minimum dollar amount. That's important. Whatever you're guaranteed as a minimum makes the contract binding. If you have something that purports to be an IDIQ contract and doesn't have a guaranteed minimum of something, quantities or dollars, then it's probably going to be a non-binding basic ordering agreement, a BOA, where the government can place orders and you can accept them through performance or accept them in writing, but you don't need to accept them because they're essentially just purchase orders that you can choose to deliver or not. Same with a requirements contract. Requirements contract needs exclusivity to be binding. Um, if the government is not promising exclusivity through, by, through the contract terms or it's not clear, uh, it might be a BOA too. Next slide. Great. Thank you, Sky. You, um, we're gonna Thank you, Sky. We're going to talk about labor and employment here um, just very briefly. Um, like some of these other clauses um, that we talked about, the topics that we talked about, labor and employment is um, a, a pretty a fairly large part um, of the FAR and, and FAR Part um, 22. We weren't able to list all of the FAR 52.2. Um, FAR clauses on this list, um, but I think it that kind of just shows the importance of the clause or of the of the of the topic um, for contracts that FAR Part 22 where they where for those contracts where those apply, um, you want to make sure that you're paying your employee the prevailing wages as determined by the state um, the Secretary of Labor um, or or the wage determinations that are applicable to your contract um, either the wage determinations that are issued by the Department of Labor or the collective bargaining agreement that's accepted by um, the Department of Labor. And the wage determination in CBAs are typically incorporated into the contract and thus become a, a contract requirement. And oftentimes you'll see, um, and the government should provide them as well in the solicitation so that you're able to use those um, requirements and, and, and bid your contract to ensure that you're paying your employees the proper wage. If uh, FAR 52.222-8 is in your contract, um, you must maintain payrolls and basic records for a period of three years after um, the laborers and mechanics working at the site of the work. Um, records have to include names, addresses, social security numbers, um, the worker's classification, hourly rates and wages paid, um, including you know, bona fide fringe benefits um, of, for that particular contractor. And it's important that you know if you know, FAR Part 22 applies and, and where it applies to your contract, that you're keeping these adequate records and recognizing that the government can and will conduct audits to ensure that employees are being paid the proper wage. Um, and, the, it's, and that's important because failure to pay that proper wage to um, your employees um, or your subcontractor's failure to pay the proper wage to their employees can result in the government withholding funds from um, your, your payments or suspending payments. Um, so that they can ensure that your employees are provided with the appropriate back wages. Um, other important topics or points that we want to make sure you understand from these clauses are the price adjustment clauses. So 52.222-30 um, through 32, and then um, dash 43 through 44 um, are where where the FAR talks about how contractors can um, obtain price adjustments related to um, changes um, in wages. And reciprocally, the government can also um, seek a, a price adjustment um, for wages and labor decreases or changes in labor decreases as well. Um, so these price adjustments can come from some for official action. So for example, um, if there is a new wage termination that's applicable at the anniversary date or the option year of your contract, um, then and, and the wages increase your your cost, um, and you're, you're, you have to pay your employees more, then you can request an equitable adjustment. Um, also, um, if there are new wages, or, uh, wages um, after, if wages are impacted that are applicable by operation of law, for example, um, or if there's an amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act um, and that changes the minimum wage and that changes the wages that you have to pay your employees, um, then contractors can you know, seek an equitable adjustment. But like I said, um, government can also come back if the wages decrease and ask for um, money back. I mean, the, the key reason that the government has these um, price adjustment clauses and, and contracts is because the government doesn't want contractors and contractors aren't allowed to include contingencies in their proposals and in their contract costs um, related to potential increased wages. So they want to just be able to give the contractor the opportunity to adjust their, um, to, to adjust the contract um, based on, you know, these 
actions um, that may occur and, and increase the contractor's wages. So it's important to just read these clauses very carefully and make sure you buy by them. Um, regarding labor disputes, if there's a, a labor dispute that relates to the applicability of a wage determination, for example, um, that sort of issue is handled by uh, the Department of Labor. Um, but the boards and courts, which we'll talk about when we talk a little bit about disputes, can also hear um, can hear claims that relate to labor issues when they're trying to decide the party's contractual rights. And with that, I'll, I'll move it over to you, Sky, for options. Next slide, please. Perfect, thank you. So we've covered the major topics that were that necessitate a lot of discussion. We're now going to cover some other baskets of clauses just to put you on notice of them, but we're going to cover them pretty briefly. Uh, they only require a few you know, seconds or minutes each. Uh, so options, next slide. Options, be aware that there's four types of options that will be in your contract. Pay close attention to what you have. Um, the primary one for extra option years, which is what people talk about, is that last one, 52 217-9. Um, that's the standard one. The government has the right to extend the contract for a year. If they decide not to, that is not a termination because the option is just purely optional. Um, and so you're not gonna be entitled under most circumstances to any types of termination costs that Michelle talked about. The contract has just lapsed, it's just ended. Um, the one above it, dash eight, extending services, that gives the government the right to extend services for six months. They can do it um, piecemeal. So one month, one month, one month, up to six. They cannot go over six months. You can't have anything more than six months being performed under this option. And usually at the end of it, it's really just a bridge over to allow the government a little extra time to keep performing at the exact same rates that they were getting under the previous year uh, in order so they can get a solicitation out and get a new contract awarded in place. Um, they can't rely on it to continue. And once it's done, they're not going to have the right to go back and exercise other options um, because that would be out of order. Um, the dash seven is different, and that's just basically increasing quantities. So if they want the performance period to continue, they need to do dash nine. And if they want to give themselves the right to increase the maximum, they would do dash seven. Um, just be aware that if the government effectively exercises an option through some problem, they're either late by a day um, or they don't give the proper preliminary notice or they don't give the proper notice. Um, and, you know, they now tell you to perform. There's an obligation to perform, but you're going to be entitled to your total cost of performing because it's really in this unusual quasi-constructual um, holdover period. Um, don't stop performing, but very explicitly reserve your rights that the government has exceeded their authority. It is a material breach, cardinal change at least. Um, and so if you reserve that, you might be able to be entitled to, um, in addition to kind of the, the general remedy, um, other other rights and remedies. We have those listed out. Next slide. International and trade. Again, it's a complex topic, but real briefly, the Buy America Act and the Trade Agreements Act, uh, two main ones right there. They apply to end products um, and also construction material. Um, sometimes required to be flowed down. Uh, contractors may need to certify those. Um, they're very similar, uh, but, they're, but they're slightly different. And so we're just gonna briefly cover them. Um, both of them have lists of exemptions. So certain countries, certain countries that are subject to multilateral trade agreements might be exempted from the requirements of this list if you're buying from those, I mean, if those are your vendors or subcontractors. Um, for TAA, Trade Agreements Act, the test is whether a product is substantially transformed into a new product. Um, it's fact-intensive test. There's no real clear bright line for most things, but there are a bunch of published cases on it. Um, just the idea is, if you're acquiring a bunch of goods and subcomponents from uh, different countries, um, which country transforms it into the final product? Um, not always, rarely clear, uh, especially in our current global supply chain. Buy America Act, um, also uh, similar, but focuses differently on was the product manufactured in the United States or are more than 50% of the components um, from domestic, domestically sourced. So that's, they're similar, they have similar types of exemptions, but they're different. Next slide. We have the limitations clauses. Again, these are government taxpayer fiscal reasons. So the government might have a contract. They might say, we hope that it costs us $20 million to perform it, but we're gonna incrementally fund it, you know, a million dollars at a time uh, for a few months at a time. That's the limitation of funds clause, 52-232-22. Um, the government might also set a maximum ceiling, which is the limitation of cost clause, the dash 20. Um, in both of those, uh, the government, you know, you might have the obligation to perform so long as it's funded, but the clauses specifically say, you know, once you hit the level, either for the limitation of funds or the cost, 
then you have the right to stop. Um, so it's something contractors rarely remember, uh, but good to remember that the, that's what the clause directs. Next slide. Data rights and IP. If you have a defense contract, that's going to be spelled out in your defense contracts and the DFARs, which will, I, I take it to be next year. That's a hot topic. The FAR data rights just in general. Um, key things to remember is the government doesn't want to own your technology, just have rights to use it typically. Um, just remember there's different types of rights, limited, restricted. Um, those are the kind of things for computer software. You, know, you don't have the right to do anything with Microsoft Word, just use it. That's typically where you want to get the government in that box of limited restricted. Um, but if the government is partially funding the development of the item, they might get some higher uh, rights. And if there are subject to other rights or in any situation, even if you're delivering limited restricted, make sure you always mark them appropriately in accordance with what's required by the clause. Next slide. Inspection and acceptance, important thing to remember here is the government has the right to inspect and accept supplies and services. Um, contractors are also required to inspect, test, and, and make sure that their services or um, supplies are going to conform to the contract. The government has a remedy for failure to, um, to conform. Um, I talked about termination for default, that's one. Um, the government can also require the contractor to repair or replace an item. Um, at no cost or at the contractor's cost, um, or they can reject it, uh, reject the supplies or services and request a price reduction. There, there may be some remedies um, for contractors, so in the instance where the government over inspects or improperly rejects, um, that's something you'd wanna um, talk to an attorney about. Next slide, please. Subcontracting, um, and we're, we're down to our last two slides, so thanks for hanging on for us. Um, subcontracting, we have, um, it's really, subcontracting is really important. Um, we define, it's defined here on the slide and under FAR 4.101, is any supplier, distributor, vendor, or firm that furnishes supplies or services to or from a prime contractor or another subcontractor, it's a very broad definition. Um, it's important for contractors um, who are using subcontractors or have subcontractors that have lower tier subcontractors that we've kind of talked about some of these um, clauses that you're properly flowing those clauses down to your subcontractors. Um, it's important also for prime contractors um, to, to recognize when consent to subcontract might be required and that's going to be spelled out in FAR 52244-2 um, and, and it's only applicable in, in limited instances but it requires you to get um, approval from the government before you can enter into subcontract and failure to do that might um, prevent the government or might allow the government not to pay you for those subcontract costs. So it's really important to understand when that applies. Um, and just, it's also important for contractors to just make sure that they have, um, that they're you know, establishing procedures and policies related to subcontracting and following those procedures and poli policies. Next slide, please. And with that, we're going to close out FAR Part 52 with a discussion on disputes and just very high level discussion. FAR 52 233-1 um, governs the disputes, uh, the disputes provisions or clauses within a government contract. Uh, contractors can protest. They can protest uh, solicitation and improprieties and improper awards, which I'm sure you've heard about if you've been tuning into the discussion. Um, the forum for protest, the Government Accountability Office or the Court of Federal Claims. Um, for contract claims, uh, the submission of a claim initiates a dispute, and claims have to be claims that are over $100,000 needs to be certified. Um, you're submitting that claim to the contracting officer, and claims can be made by the government as well by final decision. Um, but once you get a final decision from the government, um, from the government contracting officer, you have a right to appeal, and those forums are the Board of Contract Appeals. Um, depending on the, your, your type of contract, you might be at the Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals, or the Civilian Board of Contract Appeals, um, or the Postal Service Board of Contract Appeals, or the Court of Federal Claims. And so with that, we'll um, turn this back over to Jennifer Schaus and Associates to close us out. Thanks for a great presentation, Michelle and Skye, and to our audience members, we thank you again for participating with us. If you have questions about this part, please contact the speakers with the contact information you see on the screen. And if you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.